Hello and welcome back one and all to the RimWorld Eternal Winter series, where as per usual we have much to do. Today in particular will be a very monumentous day for our dynasty overall. But before we get to that, I wanted to briefly mention the fact that I've been having issues getting our immature Dryads to become woodmakers and I wasn't sure as to why. Apparently Snowdrop can't make them change and I was very confused by this, but turns out I had Basic turned off for her for whatever reason. Either way though, after switching that back on, that seemed to do the trick, and now we have two of them that are actually incubating in pods. Now that that little dilemma is solved, it's time for some research. We're actually going to be researching Devil Strand. Now, I know that's a little weird because we can't actually grow it where it's so cold, but we can grow Cool Strand, which is its winter variant. To the extent of my knowledge, which isn't much, so don't quote me on this, but I do believe that Cool Strand is basically identical to Devil Strand in terms of its properties and stats, everything except for the fact that that cool strand grows in the winter. Of course though we all well know that research takes time so while we're researching cool strand we're also going to be working on expanding our food storage area because as you can see it is absolutely stuffed to the brim. It is literally spilling out into the floors. We ended up creating several new food storage barrels to try and hold all of the winter bloom plants and the meat that we've collected thus far. And at least for the moment I think this should do. And of course we also have another small problem project that I'd like to work on for a hot moment here. Now we are going to be making some armor as well as helmets for the two impids that we imprisoned and have recruited since last episode because you guys had mentioned that you would like to see them join our blood guard and I do totally agree with that sentiment. I think that they've earned their place after last episode's tournament but they could use a little bit of... There we go. I do believe that this attire is much more fitting for the two newest members of our esteemed Blood Guard. It was also around this time that we ended up finally brewing our first few batches of fine winter ale, which is no doubt very stout and delicious. We had also finally finished our extensive research into the winter plant known as Cool Strand. Now, we don't know if it's just like Devil Strand or not for sure, although I am fairly sure that it is, so I'm going to do a small test field here to see if it's even worth our time on a massive scale. And I say that because though it would be great at insulating us from the cold, so is Muffalo and Bison Wool, two resources that we have an overabundance of, so we need something that's very durable as well. As we're waiting on that to grow though, and as everyone's just kind of going about their night doing their nightly duties, I thought about introducing a brand new mod, the Empire mod, which is actually a mod that I recently used in my Gun Empire series, and I think I'm going to use that here as we are literally creating a medieval dynasty, a medieval uh, empire, if you will. So even though, yes, I did recently use it in another big series that I had done, I'm going to be using it here as well, although it is worth noting that I am going to be using it in a different way, I suppose. I'm not going to be creating this massive section of settlements that we own for taxes or for conquering a uh, another faction or anything like that. We're only going to be using it pretty sparsely to broaden our horizons and our territories. And unlike in the Gun Empire series where we would hire mercenaries to go out and settle these new areas, in this series we're actually going to be giving it something like a gift to our most esteemed nobleman. And I couldn't think of anyone better to go out and form a vassal state under the eternal flame than Genevieve and Rick. For one, both of them are extremely brave and have proven themselves time and time again to be loyal to the crown. But also, of course, they are married, meaning they will have many, many children in the very near future, forming their very own dynasty attached to ours. Or under ours, just however you want to look at it, I suppose. But regardless, it would be a further expansion of our empire into territories that we can't currently reach just outside of our keep. So we would send them out after they would collect plenty of food and they would travel to a nearby area on the main road. There's a few reasons that we decided to settle on the road, of course, one of which being that it makes it much easier to navigate and to travel here, of course, but also because it will become a prime trading hub for any food or animals that we decide to sell here. And of course, sticking with that theme, as you can see, we would immediately build some farmland inside, such as our planter box with some skylights, as well as a fur trapping camp. Due to our 
lack of manpower, it would take a while for these two construction projects to be finished, but once they were finished, we would be able to put our available manpower into our animal hunting, which would end up giving us an estimated tax of 412 silver from the one settlement. Which is not too shabby, we'll be able to use these taxes to put back into the settlement, growing its size and power, as well as being able to raise an army. With that monumentous task finally completed, I decided to begin naming some of our critters, such as our yeti that we're going to be naming Frostbite. Of course, this wonderful name comes from our good friend Banna Master 6768 who is saying we should name the Yeti Frostbite because of its wonderful color scheme and, of course, because of the Eternal Winter. An absolutely splendid reason for the name and very fitting. Also, I really like the name because it's super badass and I feel like it will strike fear into the elves and impids who dare oppose us, as well as anyone else, of course. With a name like that, Lao and Frostbite will be unstoppable. But of course we can't forget about naming Oz's dire wolf that we also purchased last episode alongside our yeti that we're actually going to be naming Ares. And this of course comes from our good friend Wick Tordreluski 5117 Sorry, I know I butchered your name, but I also agree that Ares is a perfect name for the wolf. I assume you thought this because of the Greek god, and I totally agree. And for a time, I wasn't too sure as to what we should do, so I just sat back and watched them mine out some resources from our brand new mines in the northern mountains, but then I had an idea. You know, Snowdrop is probably old enough now to go out on her own on a mission as Aza did to prove herself, so we're going to make her a special weapon for her trip. And of course, there was no one better suited for this job than Squiggle herself, who ended up finally creating this beautiful weapon. Now this may look like a normal shotgun or rifle to you, but nay my friends, this is a hand mortar. It's basically just as the name would describe it, think a Napoleonic or medieval-ish era grenade launcher. And yeah, that's, that's about what it does, and it seems to be pretty good, and honestly, it's fairly accurate, or at least more accurate than we would have thought. Since Aza is always dual-wielding ice wands, I thought it might be fair to give Snowdrop her very own powerful weapon. And with that, it would be time for us to all meet in the war room and begin planning out what Snowdrop's mission will consist of. Snowdrop here is actually going to be going out to a local elven logging site where she will slay all of the elves unless some do not die and of course at which point she will take them prisoner but most importantly she will be collecting any of their resources like timber or logs. She is a little bit younger than Aza though so we will cut her some slack as her main mission is basically to take down the logging camp and survive of course. To ensure that that is what happens we will also be sending out the majority of our blood guard along with Aza herself. The journey itself was not all that long but of course was extremely cold and free rigid. We'd finally arrived though at the logging site and even from a distance we could see scattered elves all over the camp. Though it doesn't appear that they had spotted us nor were they expecting our caravan so we would try to catch them off guard. With the element of surprise we would immediately begin charging into their camp and firing at them. It may have been best to do this mission in the dead of night with a bit of stealth but with a weapon like uh, this... Yeah, there's not much room for stealth, I'm afraid. Snowdrop was holding her own, though she was growing a bit tired of the blood guard swooping in and overprotecting her during the battle. This would cause her to look for any ample opportunity possible to fight an elf one-on-one -on -one to prove herself. Something that very well may be very possible because these elves were quite tough, shockingly. They fought very valiantly against us and were standing their ground. For a couple of hours, they were completely surrounded by us. One of them did end up falling, but the other would stand their ground and continue firing their crossbow from afar. This would be the perfect opportunity for Snowdrop to rush in with her dagger and take her down. For you see, Snowdrop did not see a dangerous elf that could kill her with a mere shot from the crossbow. She saw yet another mountain to climb, yet another milestone to conquer, and so she did. Proving that she could hold her own without any help, just as her sister, father, and her mother can. Well, now our main goal of keeping Snowdrop alive was completed, it's time for goal two, prisoners as well as timber, which we found plenty of wood and we would actually end up taking a few prisoners with us, but I will spoil this for you, many of them ended up dying from hypothermia on the way home. Speaking of which though, of course, the journey home will take a little bit of time, so in the meantime, I suppose we could check back in on the keep and just see how everything's going, and which I did, but unfortunately this would be interrupted. We have 
have a raid from the Grey River Pact. This massive raid seemed to consist of two large groups, one coming from the west that mostly consisted of Itakin slaves as well as elven village people, and they weren't all that well equipped or armed with armor or weapons in general, but they were being led by a heavily armed and very strong looking dwarf. From the east came a smaller group of very well equipped elven guards. Some of them appeared to be royal guards that were actually escorting the king. Yes indeed, you heard that right, the elven king has decided to show his ugly face. This battle shall be won for the ages regardless of the outcome, and I only say that because we are heavily outnumbered, with the majority of our forces out with Snowdrop. The keep is very much lacking in manpower, but we will defend our home nonetheless. Our defenses were quickly becoming overwhelmed as they broke through our traps and also through our doors of the tower. We would need to make a retreat. Their dwarven general was pushing hard against our defenses and ended up taking down Snow White in the process. Moinkow and Vasferon were completely surrounded. She would try using her abilities to help them both escape, but unfortunately it was too late and they were both easily downed. We hid within one of our towers, firing at many of the enemies that we could see through our embrasures while the others lit our fields of winter bloom as well as many of our buildings on fire. Our city was completely overwhelmed by the enemy. This was no longer a raid, nor had it been from the start. This was a complete invasion and takeover of the Eternal Flame. Rosh would not let his kingdom fall so easily, though rushing out to attack the Elven King when his guard was down. He held his own quite well, and for a moment it appeared that he was even winning, but this was not a fair fight. The Dwarven General would flank him, and eventually they took him down together. Once the others saw that Rosh had fallen, they rushed out to try and help them as best that they could. They would even take the Dwarven General on directly, but unfortunately, Squiggle was quickly killed, and as were the others. The only one of our nobility left standing was Lim, but that was only briefly. Lim was quickly downed as well, and then the elves decided that they had done enough damage, they were going to try and kidnap who they could, and leave the area. Rosh lay in the field surrounded by fire, but he was bleeding very heavily from his side. Unfortunately, he ended up dying there in that field. But Rosh did not go out regretfully, no. He died thankfully. Thankful that his daughters did not have to see what occurred here today, nor were they part of the slaughter. And he was thankful for what he had, his friends, and his family. He was thankful that he had reunited with at least one of his brothers before this had happened. He was thankful that he had the opportunity to build such a wonderful kingdom for his family and for his friends. That he had the opportunity to lead them into a better life. Even if the outcome of that better life were cinder, smoke, and death. For a while we were a light in the dark of this planet, but now the light goes out, as all things do. But some fires are eternal. Snowdrop and Aza had finally returned home, and they could see the black bellowing smoke in the distance from the kingdom. As we approached the entranceway, we could hear Moin Cow inside the tower, her blood-curdling screams for help. She was in agony. Piub would quickly run in and begin tending to her, but Moin Cow would express much concern for the others because no one had came to rescue her all throughout the night. She feared the worst. And of course we now see that she was right to have been concerned. Aza and Snowdrop approached their father's charred corpse, lying in a field. Horror, shock, sadness, none of these words even begin to describe a fraction of what they were feeling in this moment. Their emotional states would only continue to escalate further once they found the bodies of the others lying not far from their fathers, including their poor, poor mother, Squiggle, Sissy, and that damned dwarf that had taken them down. Sadness quickly began turning into rage. The rage was only fueled further once they saw that their uncle Rosario had also been killed and or bled to death when he was being kidnapped out in the fields. They have no one now, all alone, in a burning kingdom of ashes and smoke and corpses. They have no one and they have nothing. In the span of mere hours, everything had changed. Their lives were upside down. 
Some time later, we had managed to dig out a very rough looking crypt just above our arena to bury Zippy as well as Rosh. We actually made their sarcophagi out of the remaining silver in our treasury, but even this fine metal is not worthy enough to hold the bodies of our beloved parents. We had also built a larger room with three beautiful granite sarcophagi just below where Rosh and Zippy are buried for our three remaining heroes. And we would of course hold burial ceremonies as well as eulogies for each and every one of them, starting out with our beloved Rosh and Zippy in their own room. A very very beautiful yet bittersweet somber affair it was, especially since immediately after we had to conduct another type of ceremony. The kingdom needs a leader. And Snowdrop, of course, is next in line. We must, of course, follow tradition, though, and hold a ceremony to make it official. And so we did, of course. Arise now, Jarl Snowdrop. Daughter of Jarl Rosh and Lady Zippy, ruler of Mount Rosh and keeper of the Eternal Flame. Let none oppose your rule over these mountains, over this land, and over this planet, for you are chosen. I want to thank you all ever so much for watching Season 1 of the RimWorld Eternal Winter series. I uh, didn't exactly plan for this one to be Season 1, the ending of Season 1, of course, unfortunately, but uh, that's just kind of how the game dealt things out to us, so I do hope you guys have enjoyed. I want to thank you guys, of course, for supporting me throughout the entire series. I love you guys ever so much, and I hope to be back fairly soon with Season 2. But until then, I will see you next time. Goodbye.